All right, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. And we'll just jump into the first two verses where Jesus is going to cleanse a leper. All right, verse 1. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So the miracles of Jesus attracted a lot of attention, but so did his teaching ministry. And Matthew demonstrated this by his mention of the great multitudes that followed him after him coming down from the Mount of uh, Beatitudes. So coming down from the mountain, that is, that's when he was done with the Sermon on the Mount. And it's probably in the second year of his ministry. And when we compare the events of this chapter with the record of Mark or Luke, we're going to find a different order and chronology. Uh, along with others, um, Carson uh, will claim that Matthew arranged his material here according to topics and themes, not according to chronology. Matthew does not purpo uh, purport to follow anything other than a topical arrangement, and most of the, his time indicators are very loose here. So we remember an important foundational verse for Matthew's Gospel. Now Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and disease among the people. That happened in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Well, Matthew went on to tell us about the teaching ministry of Jesus in Matthew chapters 5 through 7 with the Sermon on the Mount. Now he's going to tell us more about the healing ministry of Jesus and how his works confirmed his words. And so, in the ancient world, leprosy was a terrible, destructive disease, and still is in some parts of the world today. The ancient leper had no hope of improvement. They were completely without hope. And so, this leper came to Jesus with a great sense of need and desperation. And so... Leprosy might begin with a loss of all sensation in some parts of the body. The nerve trunks are affected. The muscles would waste away. The tendons will contract until the hands are like claws. Um, there would be ulceration of the hands and the feet. And then comes a progressive loss of fingers and toes. It would just eat away uh, further uh, from the tips of your fingers all the way in and the tips of your nose. Until the whole hand or the whole foot might drop off. And so according to Jewish law and customs, one had to keep about six feet or two meters from a leper. If the wind was blowing toward a person from a leper, they had to keep 45 meters away or 150 feet. And so the only thing that was more defiling than contact with a leper was contact with a dead body in the Jewish mind. And so... Uh, for all these reasons, the condition of leprosy is a model of sin and its effects. It's very ugly and it wastes, you know, it's, it's contagious. It's, it's a debilitating disease that corrupts its victim and makes him essentially dead while alive. And it followed that um, almost universally society and religious people scorned lepers. Rabbis especially despised lepers and saw them as people under the special judgment of God uh, who would be deserving of no pity or mercy. So in Jesus' time, rabbis sometimes boasted or bragged about how badly they treated lepers. One bragged that he refused to buy even an egg on a street where he even saw a leper. Another boasted that he threw rocks at lepers upon seeing them. And so nevertheless, this leper came to Jesus by himself and despite all the discouragements that were against him. He knew how terrible his problem was. He knew that other people gave up on him as having this hopeless condition, just like the rest of us. He had no one who would or could take him to Jesus. He had no previous example of Jesus healing a leper to even give him hope of this. He had no promise that Jesus would heal him at all. And he had no invitation from Jesus or the disciples to even come whatsoever. And he must have felt ashamed and alone in that crowd, that Jewish crowd that saw him as an outcast. And so despite his desperate condition this man not only begged Jesus he also worshipped him and the Greek verb is proskinin uh, and that word is never used of anything but the worship of the gods and it always describes a man's feeling and action in presence of the divine so how did this leper worship Jesus 
He worshipped Jesus by coming to him, honoring him as the one who could meet his otherwise impossible need. He worshipped Jesus with his posture, probably bowing or kneeling before Jesus. He worshipped Jesus with the word Lord, honoring him as master and God. Lord is like being a master, lordship. He worshipped Jesus with his humility, not by um, demanding, but leaving the request up to the will of Jesus, to the will of God. And he worshipped Jesus with his respect of the power of Jesus, saying that all was necessary was the will of God, the will of Jesus, and that he would be healed. And he worshipped Jesus with his confidence that Jesus could make him more than just healthy. Jesus could make him clean. And so... The leper had no doubt whatsoever about the ability of Jesus to heal. His only question was if Jesus was willing to heal. And he believed in the power of Jesus. And when a Syrian commander named Naaman was afflicted with leprosy, he came to Jehoram, uh, the king of Israel, because he heard that there was a prophet in Israel whom God used to do miraculous things. When Naaman came to Jehoram, Jehoram knew that he had no power to help him. And he said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends a man to heal me of his leprosy in 2 Kings chapter 5 or 7? And so leprosy was so hopeless in the ancient world that healing a leper was compared to raising the dead. Yet, this leper knew that all Jesus needed was to be willing. And so this leper was sure that Jesus was willing to use his power for the leper's benefit. Men more easily believe in miraculous power than in miraculous love. And this leper sought more than just healing. He wanted a cleansing, not only from the leprosy, but also from all of its terrible effects on his life and his soul. In addition to this, this is the first place in the gospel where Jesus is called Lord. This title that was particularly meaningful in the light of the fact that the word Lord was used to translate the Hebrew word Yahweh, and Matthew wrote his gospel to those who would be familiar with this Jewish context of that word. This is the first association of the Greek word kurios in the New Testament, which is translated Lord, and it's used as master or rabbi, and about 650 times it's used to be a title of Jesus, and so it's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Adonai, which means master. So verse 3. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So this was a bold and compassionate touch from Jesus. The idea is that the leper kept his distance from Jesus, but he put out his hand and touched him. So it was against the ceremonial law to touch a leper, which made the touch all the more meaningful to the afflicted man. And of course, as soon as Jesus touched him, he was no longer a leper. And so Jesus did not have to touch the leper in order to heal him. He could have healed him with a word or even a thought, yet he healed the leper with a touch because this is what the leper needed. And Jesus often varied in the manner of healing, as we will see as we move forward through the four Gospels. And usually he chose a particular manner that would be meaningful to the afflicted individual. In Mark chapter 1 verse 41 will say that when Jesus looked, he was moved with compassion. He had been a long time, uh, it, it, it had been a long time since this leper had seen a face of compassion in his state. And so, leprosy is Hansen's disease. Uh, that would be today's term for leprosy. Uh, Mycobacterium uh, leprae bacillus is the uh, bacillus that causes lesions of the skin and superficial nerves. It attacks the eyes, the genitals, the extremities, hands, feet, the basic internal corruption that eventually causes the erosion of tissue and it results in deformed and erosive extremities. It's a very loathsome disease and you can google the pictures yourself. And it's very visible in its later stages and it is a manifestation of the corruption within. What is causing the external appearance is the corrosion internally. And so, 
Dapson is a drug that treats leprosy, yet in the 1980s around the world they've discovered that the resistance to that drug is increasing and therefore they expect the existence of leprosy to increase. Most prevalent in the low, humid, tropical areas of Asia, Africa, South America, and the Pacific Islands. In about 2 million known cases of the planet Earth today of leprosy, and suspect about 11 million if they knew them all, uh, it does seem to be transmitted through prolonged physical contact during certain times, certain times uh, contagious, others not, and certain susceptibilities. Primarily, it gets transmitted through the uh, improperly sterilized hypodermic needles and tattooing needles. And so in a biblical sense, leprosy is very detailed in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. There is no cure for leprosy in the Old Testament other than the Lord himself. Miriam in Numbers chapter 12 verse 13 and Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 verses 1 through 15 as notable examples. In the Old Testament, God is also using leprosy as a symbol of sin, a physical representation of what it would look like from his perspective. So leprosy is a disease, and there is an inner corruption that manifests itself outwardly, especially in the later stages. Exactly what sin is, it's a form of corruption, it's a disease, and we've all got it. And so leprosy is a disease, it's an inner corruption that manifests itself outwardly, especially in those later stages as we talked about. And um, in this case, it's a genetic disease. In the mind of this leper, there is no basis for healing outside of God. By calling him Lord, it's showing his understanding of Jesus being God incarnate. He is making that connection. And so that leper, if we put ourselves in the story, is you and I. We have a disease that's worse than leprosy. We have a disease that God identified with leprosy in the Old Testament. And his ritualism to educate them about the evils of leprosy apply to you and I. In that we are sinners. We have a disease and there is no known cure. Only God himself can make you clean. So what do you have to do? You acknowledge who he is, Lord, and that he is the one that makes you clean. Simple as that. And so, Jesus' assurance that I am willing simply answered the man's question and gives us a starting point for the times that we wonder if Jesus is willing to heal. We should assume Jesus is willing to heal unless he shows us differently. So how can we know if Jesus is willing to heal us? By assuming that he is willing, but listening to him if he should tell us that he does not. And this is how it happened with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7-10, through 10, when he got the thorn in the flesh. And it seems that Paul assumed that Jesus would heal his thorn in the flesh until word came to him that he would not. And let's take a look at that. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7-10 through 10 will say, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. This is Paul speaking. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For, then, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And so, the former leper's life was changed forever. Uh, he was not only healed, but as he requested, he was cleansed. And Jesus had recently said, Ask and it will be given to you in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. And this is certainly true for the now cleansed former leper. And this is the first individual healing that's described by Matthew. Previously, we were told of Jesus' healing ministry in a general sense in Matthew chapter 4. But here we're getting a specific case. Verse 4, And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. 
So Jesus often commanded people to be quiet about their healing or some miraculous work that he did for them. Uh, he did this because he wanted to keep down the excitement of the crowds until the proper time for his uh, formal revelation to Israel, which was the, the exact date prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, comma, but not for himself. And those are weeks of years, so there's 490 uh, 483 weeks. And so in addition, Jesus' miracles are 483 years. <laughs> Those are weeks of years. <clears throat> so in addition, Jesus' miracles were not primarily calculated to make him famous or as a celebrity, th though they certainly did give him testimony to his ministry. Uh, even more so is that Jesus healed to meet the specific needs of specific individuals and to demonstrate the evident power of the Messiah in the setting of love and care for the personal needs of humble people. Therefore, Jesus was cautious about how the multitude saw him and why they followed him. And so Mark's going to tell us that the leper did not obey Jesus and instead he went out and began to proclaim it freely uh, in Mark chapter 1 verses 4 through 45. And so Jesus commanded the man to give a testimony to the priest. Why? Because the priest would know that something was up if a leper had been cleansed, that God would be present for that to have happened. And so what a testimony it was. So the Mosaic Law prescribed specific sacrifices to be conducted upon the healing of a leper. And when the man reported it to the priest, they no doubt had to perform ceremonies that were rarely, if ever, done. And that's outlined in Leviticus chapter 14. So going to the priest would also bring the former leper back into society. Jesus wanted the healing of the man's disease to have as much of a benefit as possible. And so this gift was too little living clean birds, some cedar wood with scarlet and hyssop in Leviticus 14 verse 4, which were to be brought for his cleansing. And when clean, two he lambs, one ewe lamb, and three tenths deals of flour and one log of oil in Leviticus 14 verse 10. But if the person was poor, then he was to bring one lamb, a tenth deal of flour and one log of oil and tur two turtle doves or young pigeons because they were cheaper. Uh, and that's in verse 21 and 22, Leviticus 14. And so that would, should have sparked these priests to be like, whoa, something is up. A leper has been cleansed. Because uh, this would have rarely, if ever, had ever been done. All right, verses 5 through 6. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 13, is going to tell us that this, this is where Jesus lived, Capernaum. He came and dwelt in Capernaum. Uh, the centurion was obviously a Gentile because a centurion was an officer in the Roman army. And almost every Jew under Roman occupation felt a reason to hate the centurion because they were under Roman occupation. Yet he came to a Jewish teacher for help. And that's significant. Uh, significantly enough, he came not for a selfish reason, but on behalf of his servant, one of his employees. And so whenever the New Testament mentions a centurion, and there are at least seven, it presents them as honorable good men. And this centurion had an unusual attitude towards his slave. And under Roman law, a master had the right to kill his slave. And it was expected that he would do so if the slave became ill or injured to the point where he could no longer work. And so a centurion is the head of about 80 men, theoretically 100, but it's not organized that way. It's what we would consider in today's vernacular of army uh, speak. It'd be like a company of people. And so as he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile, although he built the synagogue for them. Uh, a Gentile did. In the first 12 chapters, Matthew will emphasize that Jesus Christ is presenting himself to Israel not to the world at large. And what's Luke's role? Luke also talks a lot about centurions. Luke is always very kind to centurions in Luke chapter 7 verse 4. When Paul invoked his Roman citizenship and appealed to Rome in Acts chapter 25 verse 11, the Roman law required that written documentation of the appealed case had to precede the hearing. And it's believed by some scholars that Luke uh, 1 and 2, the gospel account and Acts, were those required legal documents for Paul. 
And Luke seems preoccupied to demonstrate that all the in insurrections and public unrest were always the response of Judaism by the Jews, not by Gentiles. And Roman officials were the good guys in Luke's narratives. And so he was pleading with them. So this is going to show that the centurion did not make a casual request. Matthew describes him as pleading with Jesus on behalf of his servant. All right, verse 7 through 9. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. So Jesus didn't hesitate to go to the centurion's house. And we half wish the centurion would just have allowed him to make the trip. And it was completely against Jewish custom for a Jew to enter a Gentile's house. Yet it was not against God's law. And so the centurion sensed this when he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Most Jews believe that a Gentile home was not worthy of them. And the centurion supposed that this great rabbi and teacher like Jesus would consider his home unworthy. And so the centurion is showing great respect. And so the centurion also showed great sensitivity to Jesus in that he wanted to spare Jesus the awkward challenge of whether or not to enter a Gentile's house as well as the time and trouble of travel altogether. And he didn't know Jesus well enough to know that he would not feel awkward in the least, but his consideration of Jesus in this situation is very impressive. In his concern for both his servant and for Jesus, this centurion was an others-centered person. <clears throat> And so the centurion fully understood that Jesus' healing power was not some sort of magic trick that required the magician's presence. Instead, he knew Jesus had true authority and could command things to be done and completed outside his immediate presence. And the centurion showed great faith in Jesus' word. He understood that Jesus can heal with his word just as easily as with a touch. And so the centurion also knew about the military chain of command and how the orders of one in authority were unquestioningly obeyed, right? And he said, like, I'm a man under authority and I have soldiers that are under me. Uh, and he saw that Jesus had at least that much authority. Verses 10 through 13. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. So the man's understanding of Jesus' spiritual authority made Jesus marvel. His simple confidence in the ability of Jesus' mere word to heal showed a faith that was free of any superstitious reliance on merely external things. This was truly great faith worthy of praise. And so Jesus considered the faith of this Gentile centurion a living symbol of Jewish oppression and thought it greater than any faith that he had seen among the people of Israel. And so as a political entity, there was no Israel. There was only a covenant people that was descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet Jesus still called them Israel. And the fact that such faith was present in a Gentile caused Jesus to announce that there would be Gentiles in the kingdom of heaven. They would even sit down to dinner with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is a radical idea to many people uh, of the Jewish people in Jesus' day. They assumed that this great messianic banquet would have no Gentiles in attendance and that it would be all Jews that would be there. 
And Jesus is correcting both of those mistaken ideas. And these few words of Jesus tell us a little something of what heaven is like. It's a place of rest. We sit down in heaven. It's a place of good company to sit with. We enjoy the friendship of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven. It's a place with many people. Jesus said that many will come into heaven. It's a place with people from all over the earth, from the east and west. They will come to heaven. And it's... A certain place Jesus said many will come and when Jesus says it will happen it will happen and so as well Jesus reminded his Jewish listeners that just as the Gentiles racial identity was no automatic barrier to the kingdom their racial identity was no guarantee of the kingdom and though Jews were sons of the kingdom they might end up in hell And there could be hardly any more radical statement of the change in God's plan of salvation inaugurated by the mission of Jesus. And so outer darkness, uh, it's a darkness beyond a darkness into a dungeon beyond and beneath the prison. And so the definite articles with weeping and gnashing of teeth in the Greek are going to emphasize the horror of the scene here. The weeping and the gnashing. Weeping suggests suffering and gnashing of teeth despair. And so what is it that the lost are doing? They're weeping and gnashing their teeth. So do you do you gnash your teeth now? You would not do it except that, you know unless you're in pain and agony. Well, in hell there's always gnashing of teeth. And we see that Jesus was unafraid to speak about hell. And in fact, he did, more, he did so more so than uh, any other speaker in the Bible. Jesus talks more about hell than any other person in the Bible. And there are some ministers who never mention anything about hell out there. Um, and Charles Spurgeon said that he heard of a minister who once said to his congregation, If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be sent to that place which is not polite to mention. And he ought not to have been allowed to preach again, I am sure, if he could not use plain words. And Jesus was not afraid to speak of it, and we shouldn't either. Verse 14 and 15. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. So this clearly establishes the fact that Peter was married. The Roman Catholic Church will teach that all priests must be celibate and unmarried. But the man that they would call the first and greatest pope was certainly married. And so... He touched her hand and the fever left her. So Jesus healed this woman with a gentle touch of his hand. Her sickness was much less severe than the leper, yet Jesus still cared for her. And Jesus cares for the smaller problems also. And so the miracle here was not the cure of an incurable disease, but in the way of the cure by the touch of his hand. And so Peter's mother-in-law showed a fitting response for those who have been touched by Jesus' power. She immediately began to serve Serving Jesus is a wonderful evidence of being restored to spiritual health. Verses 16 and 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So Jesus' care for the individual is shown by the implication that Jesus dealt with each person individually, not in just some cold assembly line ordeal. Uh, And many who were demon-possessed. Dr. Lightfoot gives two sound reasons why Judea in our Lord's time abounded with uh, demons. First, because they were then advanced to the very height of impiety. Uh, And you can see what Josephus, their own historian, says of them. There was not, said he, a nation under heaven more wicked than they were. And secondly, because they were then strongly addicted to magic and so, as it were, invited evil spirits to be familiar with them. 
And so that it might be fulfilled. So Matthew rightly understood this as a partial fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. That's from Isaiah chapter 53. And that primarily refers to spiritual healing, but also definitely includes physical healing. In this, Matthew showed Jesus as the true Messiah in delivering people from the bondage of sin and the effects of a fallen world. And so the provision for our healing, both physically and spiritually, was made by the sufferings, the stripes, of Jesus. The physical dimension of our healing is partially realized now, but finally, ultimately realized only in the resurrection when we are glorified. And so this healing work of our Savior cost Jesus something. It wasn't as if he had a magic bag of healing power that he drew from and he cast about to the needy. It came at the cost of his own agony, his own pain. So if his word and touch brought instant deliverance to men, it was because in a great mystery of grace he suffered in order to save. And so... This section of Matthew's Gospel is going to show four different people being healed, each one different from the other. Uh, a Jew with no social or religious privilege. You had a Gentile officer of the army occupying and oppressing Israel. And you had a woman related to one of Jesus' devoted followers. And then you had unnamed multitudes. And so their requests were also made in different ways. You had direct requests from the sufferer made in his own faith. A request from one man for another made in faith on behalf of a suffering man. No request was made because Jesus came to the sufferer, so there was no evidence of faith from the healed. And sufferers that were brought to Jesus with different kinds of faith. And Jesus used different methods to heal here. He used a touch that was forbidden. He used a word that was spoken from afar. He used a tender touch and he used a variety of unnamed methods as well. And so from all this, we understand that physical healing is an area where God especially shows his sovereignty. And he does things as he pleases, not necessarily as men might expect, trying to form, put God in a box. All right, verse 18 through 20. And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so <clears throat> when uh, Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. So Jesus increased in popularity, yet he did not follow the crowds or even seek to make them bigger. In some ways, he seemed to avoid these great multitudes that were crowding him. And so with the miracles associated with the ministry of Jesus, following him might have seemed more glamorous than it really was. And Jesus perhaps received many spontaneous offers like this. And uh, he tells them the foxes have holes and the birds of air have nests, but I have nowhere to lay it. You know, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And Jesus didn't tell the man, no, you can't follow me. But he told him the truth without painting a glamorized version of what it was like to follow him. And this is the opposite of techniques that used by many evangelists today that are trying to say, when you come and follow him, it's going to be a big old party. But Jesus wanted the man to know what it would really be like. And so, in the immediate context of Jesus' ministry, the saying does not mean that Jesus was penniless, but he was homeless. The nature of his mission kept him on the move and would keep his followers on the move as well. And many homes like Peter's were open to him, but he had none of his own. He was constantly on the move, teaching from one place to the next. And the reason this man turned away from Jesus was because Jesus lived a very simple life by faith, trusting his Father for every need and without reserves of material resources. And this is just the kind of thing that would make Jesus more attractive to a truly spiritual man. And here is a man who lives completely by faith and is satisfied with few material things. Right? I should follow him and learn from him. And so the phrase son of man is used some 81 times in the Gospels. And every time it's either something Jesus said of himself or the words of someone quoting Jesus. And it's an important phrase that he used to describe himself. He used it as a title that reflected both the glory 
in Daniel chapter 7 and the humility in Psalm 8 of the Messiah. Especially its connection to the Daniel passage means that it has an image of power and glory, yet without the unwanted associations of the other titles. So by using it often, Jesus told his listeners, I am the Messiah of power and glory, but not the one that you're expecting. All right, verse 21 and 22. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. So actually, this man did not ask for permission to dig a grave for his deceased father. He wanted to remain in his father's house and care for him until the father died. This is an obviously in an indefinite period, which could drag on and on. Yet, uh, this man was another of his disciples, yet he did not follow Jesus as he should have, nor as the twelve disciples did. This shows us that the term disciples had a somewhat broad meaning in the Gospel of Matthew and must be understood in its context. So this man wanted to follow Jesus, but not just yet. He knew it was good that he should do it, but he felt that there was a good reason why he can't do it right now. So if the scribe was too quick in promising, this disciple was too slow in performing. And so Jesus pressed the man to follow him right now the, and clearly stated the principle that family obligations or any other obligation must not be put ahead of following Jesus. Jesus must come first. And Jesus was not afraid to discourage potential disciples. Unlike many modern evangelists today painting this easy open road. Uh, he was interested more in quality than in quantity. Nothing has done more harm to Christianity than the practice of filling the ranks of Christ's army with every volunteer who is willing to make a little profession and to talk fluently of experience. In addition, Jesus was merely being honest, and this is what it meant to follow him, and he wanted people to know it at the very beginning. All right, verse 23 through 25. Now when he had got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. So the village of Capernaum was right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus, like many Galileans, was familiar with boats and life near this fairly large lake. And the Sea of Galilee is well known for its sudden violent storms. The severity of this storm was evident in the fact that the disciples, many of who were experienced fishermen on this lake, were terrified, crying out, Lord, save us, we're perishing. These were veteran fishermen that were freaking out. And so, <clears throat> though the disciples were desperate, Jesus was sound asleep. Uh, and it must have seemed strange to them that he could sleep in the middle of such a great tempest that had them freaked out. It also shows us how human Jesus was and the effect that he got tired. And so... <clears throat> The grammar of the phrase, but he was asleep, conveys a dramatic contrast. The storm raged, the disciples panicked, but he was asleep. And we're also impressed by the fact that he needed to sleep at all. And that shows his true humanity here. He became tired and would sometimes need to catch sleep whenever he was able to, even in unlikely places. So it was the sleep of one worn by an intense life involving constant strain on body and mind, constantly praying, constantly teaching, constantly heal healing. And so we're impressed by the fact that he could sleep. His mind and heart were peaceful enough, trusting in the love and care of his Father in heaven, that he could sleep in the storm. Verse 26 and 27, But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? So Jesus rebuked their fear and unbelief, not their request or waking him. Uh, we shouldn't think that Jesus was in a bad mood from being awakened. He was upset at their fear because fear and unbelief go hand in hand. They go together. And when we trust God and put our trust in him, then there's little room left for fear uh, because you're trusting God. And so... <clears throat> 
And they actually had many reasons to have faith, even great faith, because they had just seen Jesus do great, significant miracles, showing his great power and authority. They had just seen an example of great faith with a centurion who trusted Jesus to heal his servant from afar. They had just, uh, they had Jesus with them physically in the boat, and they saw Jesus sleep. His peace and demeanor should have given them peace as well. And so, Jesus didn't merely quiet the wind and the sea. He rebuked the winds and the seas. This, together with the disciples' great fear and what Jesus would encounter at his destination, leads some to believe that there was some type of spiritual attack in the storm. And so, and I'll take the same view. Adam Clark supposed that the storm was probably excited by Satan, the prince of the power of the air, who, having got the author and all the preachers of the gospel together in a small vessel, he thought by drowning it to defeat the purposes of God, and thus to prevent the salvation of the ruined world. And what a noble opportunity must this have appeared to the enemy of the human race right then and there. And so... <clears throat> The disciples were amazed, and such a powerful display over creation led them to ask, Who can this be? Well, it can only be the Lord, Jehovah, who has this power and authority. In Psalm 89, verses 8 and 9, will say, O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When waves arise, you still them. So in the span of a few moments, the disciples saw both the complete humanity of Jesus in his tired sleep and the fullness of his deity. They saw Jesus for who he is, truly man and truly God. Verse 28 and 29, And when he had come to the other side, to the country of the uh, Gergensians, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? So the other gospel accounts mention only one of these men. This must be because there was one that was far more severe in his state of demonic possession, having many demons. Uh, these two unfortunates were unclean because of their contact with the dead, and they displayed fierce, uncontrollable behavior. And the demons drove these men to live among the tombs. And so, because graveyards and the dead were terribly unclean and offensive to the Jewish people, uh, because demons loved death, because there was no proper place for men to live, because it made men more frightening to others, uh, because it encouraged superstition in others, fearing that the men would actually be possessed with the spirits of the dead in the graveyard. And so, what have we to do with you? So, the demons tormenting these poor men wanted to be left alone. They didn't want Jesus to interfere with their horrible work, right, of attacking humankind, because we're made in the image of God, and they hate that. And so, <clears throat> the demons knew who Jesus was, even if the disciples didn't. And we, we can contrast the two statements here. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, it says, Who can this be? Right? And this is from the disciples. In and, and Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, it says, Jesus, you son of God. So the demon world knows very good and well who God is. They can see things that we can't. And they were able to make this connection right off the bat. They could see it. And so these demons also knew of both their immediate destiny to be cast out and their ultimate destiny to suffer everlasting torment, which is fascinating. And so they wanted the freedom to do as much damage as they could before the time, their destiny of torment. They also understood that they had a limited time, and therefore they worked as hard as they could up until they could not work anymore. And this is one of the few admirable things that we can say about Satan and his demons. They're highly persistent and they're always at work, right? Verse 30 through 32. Now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. So both Jews and Gentiles populated the region of Galilee. So this might have been a herd of pigs owned by Gentiles. 
But most commentators believe that since the pigs were unclean for Jews, uh, they should have not have been there, even if a Gentile man owned them. And the demons wanted to enter the swine because these evil spirits are bent on destruction and they hate to be idle. And so the devil is so fond of doing mischief that he would rather play at a small game than not play the game at all. And so from Mark chapter 5, verse 13, we know that there were about 2,000 of these swine. And swine were illegal in Israel. In Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7, we'll say they're prohibited. In chapter 15, you have the prodigal son. He was finally brought to his senses when he was feeding swine, which was illegal in Israel because it's not kosher. Uh, Decapolis, these 10 cities are also Gentile cities. So the swine are being raised in support of the Gentile culture. Right, it's compromising with Gentile culture, just to let you know. All right, so <clears throat> there is nothing really comparable to this in the Bible. They came out, they went to the herd of swine, and then the whole herd of swine ran violently and perished in the water. The casting of demons from a human into animals, right? There's nowhere really else in the Bible comparable to this. Yet Jesus had a good reason to allow this. The fact that the demons immediately drove the swine to destruction helps explain why Jesus allowed the demons to enter the pigs. Because he wanted everyone to know what the real intention of these demons was. They wanted to destroy the men just like they destroyed the pigs. Because men are made in the image of God. And they could not have their way as easily with the men. They're having a fight with their free will. But their intention was just the same, to kill and destroy. Right? They're able to manipulate the pigs very easily. But with men, they're having a fight against them. There's a, a, almost two people in one space going back and forth. And so another reason why the devils were sent into the pigs was to conclusively show that they had been indeed cast out of the men. And some protest that this is unfair to the owner of the pigs. Uh, the owners of the swine lost their property. Yes, and um, we learn from this how small valued uh, temporal riches are in the estimation of God. He suffers them to be lost, sometimes to disengage us from them through mercy, sometimes out of justice and to punish us for having acquired or preserved them, either by covetousness or injustice. And uh, Spurgeon had several wise comments on the way that demons affected the swine. Swine preferred death to devilry, and if men were not worse than swine, they could be of the same opinion. They, had, uh, they run hard whom the devil drives, and the devil drives his hogs to a bad market. Okay, Verse 33 and 34. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. So since Jesus knew human nature, he knew what to expect from this crowd coming out from the city. Yet his disciples probably thought that these people would be pleased that Jesus had just delivered these formerly demon-possessed men. And so the work of Jesus had unified the whole city. They all came out to meet with and talk to Jesus, but it was not in a good way. Uh, they came to ask him to leave. And so we would think that the people of the region would be happy that these two demon-possessed men had been delivered from their condition. Perhaps they were more interested in their pigs than in people. Uh, certainly the delivering power of Jesus did not make all men feel comfortable. And this may explain another reason why the demons wanted to enter the swine. The idea is that the demons wanted to stir up hatred and rejection of Jesus. So they drove the swine to destruction hoping it would be blamed on Jesus. And he would then be unwelcome there. And so in Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8, they're going to point out that the healed guy wanted to follow the Lord. And the Lord's going to tell him, no, go witness to your people. Later in Mark chapter 6, when Jesus returns to the city the next time, there are crowds of welcome. He went out and proclaimed Jesus' message. So good thing. And so demonology here, just some notes. Demons are different than fallen angels, angels that leave their first estate and took women which they chose. Are they disembodied Nephilim, right? The Nephilim wouldn't have had a place to go like Sheol, uh, maybe Tartarus, or are they disembodied Rephaim? 
Uh, Daniel chapter 10, it's a good study. We know that demons are at Satan's control. They are some of his uh, resources. They're malevolent, they're dangerous, they're around. And if you're not a Christian, then you're vulnerable to them. If you are a Christian, know that God does not sublet his property out to demons. It doesn't happen. The Holy Spirit is not going to let a demon possess something that is inhabited by the Holy Spirit. It just won't happen. And not simply a uh, psychiatric disorder, uh, demon possession. They could not indwell, and you also note, they could not indwell animals without God's permission. Fascinating note. All right, some references for you. And you can find more study material at taylorbiblestudy.com.